welcome. Woo! Woo! It's good to see this crowd. If we haven't met, my name is Allison Harmon. I am the have the pleasure and honor of being the dean of the College of Education, Health, and Human Development. Um, I am here to welcome you to our third annual EHHD Talks. So, if this is your first time attending. This is an opportunity for us to showcase our award-winning faculty who are doing, our teachers, who are researchers, who are experts in community engagement. Tonight, we have Nigel Waterton. <laughs> yeah. You better do that so I can think of the next person. <laughs> Nicole Winnego. Rhythm. You guys got it. <laughs> Carrie Myers. <laughs> Christine Lux. <laughs> Jane Downey. <laughs> and Mitch Vaterloss. <laughs> we are so pleased you, that you could join us. This is our first attempt at nightclub outreach. <laughs> <laughs> it is not in our nature to show off in this college, so we will need a little encouragement from the audience for our speakers. My philosophy is there is no mistake so big that it can't be covered by applause. So <laughs> that's your job. Um, barring all techno glitches, we will move seamlessly through our six speakers, and then I would invite you to interact with them and ask questions informally after the show. Are you ready? Yes. Why don't we go ahead and invite our first speaker up, Nigel Waterton. Good evening. I'm Nigel Waterton. And uh, I work primarily with students seeking secondary teaching licensure in the Education Department of the College of Education, Health, and Human Development. This evening, I'd like to share with you about a partnership with Big Sky Youth Empowerment and MSU's Master of Arts in Teaching program. Some time ago, the MSU Department of Education began an initial licensure program for folks with an undergraduate degree who wanted to teach in secondary schools but didn't have a teaching license. Recently, we added a pathway for elementary licensure and expanded the secondary program, rebranding it as the Master of Arts in Teaching program. Our MAT program is aimed at addressing teacher shortages in rural Montana schools by creating a one-year pathway to teacher licensure for folks who want to take their experience and education into K-12 classrooms. By the way, if this appeals to you, uh, see me after this talk. <clears throat> Give me one year of your life and I can set you on a path of unparalleled riches and fame as a K-12 teacher, just as long as you understand that fame means people bothering you about their kids in the grocery store and you're okay with riches of a spiritual nature. <laughs> Forgive me, I, I digress. I knew I wanted to get my MAT students to engage with youth as soon as they entered our program, so I, I leaned on my past experiences to help shape one of the first courses in our MAT program. I was fortunate enough to teach a Bridger Alternative program in the Bozeman School District. Any Bridger it's out there? No? Yes? Okay. Uh, and I noticed, uh, oh, I was a, an English instructor there the last year, uh, it was at the Wilson, 2009-2010. Uh, I noticed that many of my Bridger students sported logo wear and sang the praises of youth-centered program called Big Sky Youth Empowerment, or BYEP. Uh, perhaps you've heard of them. Over time, I came to understand BYEP uh, had a fundamental purpose of uplift. That is to say, BYEP met our Bridger youth wherever they happened to be in ways that did not ask students to stop being who they are. Pause and think about your own schooling experiences. Schools sometimes ask us to be somebody different from our closest self. But that doesn't work for everyone, does it? 
Through positive affirming stances and practices, BYEP hits the sweet spot of accepting students exactly as they are, while at the same time teaching youth how to more effectively cope and navigate a world they sometimes find alienating and downright destructive. BYAP frequently does this while students were dangling from climbing harnesses or paddling around House Rock on the Gallatin River. Activities that take youth outside and create an interdependence on one another and their leaders. These outdoor excursions become a foundational activity that acts as a gateway or expressway, really, to entering uh, weekly evening workshops on interpersonal skill building. BYP builds a community, a family, if you will, of youth who over time come to trust some adults, peers, and perhaps most significantly themselves. It's this positivity and excellent rapport which aligned with my own best classroom experiences. This motivated me to establish a collaborative program with Big Sky Youth Empowerment and our MAT grad students. I wanted my students' first exposure to ideas of engaging youth to come from BYEP in part to replicate their awesome knack for rapport building, but also in part to disrupt some of the normal practices and habits found in schools that sometimes leave students behind. So with the help of BYEP program managers and mentors, we hatched a plan where a former BYEP mentor, an MSU grad who currently teaches music in the Bozeman School District, would lead one of our first MAT classes an eight-week course on communication and engagement with youth that culminated in a week-long workshop with Big Sky Youth Empowerment. By the way, that former mentor signed up to come back as a BYEP mentor in addition to her full-time teaching position uh, this year. In our course, we had MAT students read and discuss books and articles about youth engagement and then try that out in, a real time with, uh, in real time with very, very real youth. And at the end of the experience, our MAT students were given advice for their futures as teachers from BYEP youth. We turned the tables and had the youth do the teaching. I want future teachers to learn from folks that matter the most, the students that they will eventually teach. BYEP youth get to share their own education experiences with our teacher candidates. Some of it is frankly negative. School is not a friendly place for all students. I want to disrupt notions of normalcy in classrooms in such a way that my teacher candidates know that their job is to teach every student in the classroom. The field experience itself is pretty simple. MAT students participate in summer outdoor excursions like hiking, rafting, or even circus camp. When one of my current MAT students found out circus camp was an option, she about fell over volunteering for the circus performance group. I guess her early career, earlier career in uh, civil engineering did not allow for much clowning. <laughs> we piloted the program last summer and will embark on a second experience this summer based on the positive feedback from MAT students, BYAP mentors and program managers, and BYAP youth. I look forward to continuing this collaboration in the future and doing my best to reposition youth, particularly vulnerable youth, to act as mentors and guides to new teachers. And if you just uh, give me a moment up on the screen, uh, we can watch a, a really brief video that kind of frames what BYEP does. Maybe. <laughs> What's crazy to me is the way everyone talks about BYP, even if they're not a participant, if they're a mentor, the word that comes up the most far and away is family. Um, to me, BYP is a family. It's a place where I can go without worrying about being judged for the true me. All these amazing new people, having the second family I can go to. It's a really good place to just find that family and friends. It's like a family, kind of. <laughs> it's nice to have a group of people that you feel like you can be yourself around. Even in the short time I have been here, I have found a family who I will keep in my heart forever. Everybody here is going to be a family, and you've got to trust each A family each that you can laugh with. Now we have a, a second family. family. Second family that I have. Family. That I get to see everyone. There's no other way to put it. It totally is, though. So could you... It's just how it is. It's family. I don't know. <laughs> Our participants have the opportunity to join this program when they're 13, 14 years old and stay in the program all the way until they're 18. 
within each week of those four years, they're growing and being challenged and cultivating healthy relationships. And the way we do this is by delivering a social emotional curriculum each week during our workshops and then having our participants engage in weekend adventures where they're pushed out of their comfort zones physically and mentally. They get to be outside. They get to be in a community where you know their identity outside of that doesn't matter. And it just matters what they're doing in the present with their groups. I think part of it was when I started BYP, I was going through some like pretty bad bullying in school. I had um, started self-harming a few years before that, and people would like call me a freak and that kind of stuff. And then I'd like come to BYP, and there were people uh, like me. They could understand it. They weren't like all these people who judged me without knowing, you know? It's so cool to be a part of these kids' lives where you can help them understand and learn and explore the world in a healthy way and in a beautiful way because a lot of these kids come from a background where their world is not beautiful and be able to be a catalyst in that is um, extremely special and uh, I feel honored to be able to do that for them. But when you come to BYP and you're shown this like unconditional love you realize that it's not because they have to. Like they don't have to care about you, they, they want to and they do so that's why they do what they do. And that's why, like, this family can be so special and so important to so many people because, like, there's, there is no obligation to, like, love and care about each other. You just do. a friend of mine, Robin Hill, who's the executive director of Big Sky Youth Empowerment. I want to give him a few minutes to talk about Big Sky Youth Empowerment and our partnership. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Nigel. And yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, I hope you enjoyed the, the video about BYP. And um, I'm here to, one, say thank you to, to Nigel and his team for, um, for partaking in everything that we do. I think that model of teachers and training coming and learning from kids really reflects our philosophy that uh, everybody's story can be used as a source of power and perspective. Um, and when you see the kids on, on this video, a lot of them don't come from a place where they really believe that. They're often the recipients of a program um, and of services, food stamps, um, social services. Um, and that's not always a, a place of empowerment where they feel like they can make a contribution. Um, and the program's really been built on flipping that script from defining these kids through a deficit-based model um, to a strength-based model where all, you know, their, their strengths and their passions and their ideas are really valued and, and bolstered. And through the program, we see so much growth in these kids that really realize their own inner strength. Um, and we actively use that perspective to grow our program. I mean, even from the very start, um, 18 years ago, our founder, Pete McFadden, um, was a mental health counselor and was working um, with, uh, with teen boys um, and not finding a lot of success in, you know, in the counseling room um, and asked the kids, like, what, what's not working here? Like, what can we do better? Um, and they said that they wanted to get outside. Um, and so Pete took them up to Big Sky skiing and snowboarding and was finding that he was having more powerful conversations on the chairlift um, that he was having in the counseling room. Um, and since then, over the course of 18 years, our curriculum, our training for our program managers, everything's really been based on learnings that we have gathered from our kids. And as a result, um, everything that we do is more powerful and more successful um, because of their input um, and their perspective. Um, and I think it's really special thinking about teachers in a similar light that there's so much to learn you know, from these kids um, and so much power to be gained from having teachers learn from, you know, kids who are truly the experts in the teen experience. Um, and it's also such a wonderful experience for our kids to feel like they have that voice to help, um, help young teachers become 
really good at what they do. Um, so it's really a mutually beneficial program. We're so excited to be working with Nigel moving forward. Um, and just want to say thanks again for having me out tonight. Thank you. My name is Nicole Winego, and I am our Family Consumer Sciences Teacher Educator here at Montana State University. When you see this face, what do you see? Do you see a scientist, an activist, a pioneer? Do you see an adult educator, a botanist? How about a teacher or a volunteer? A dreamer, a designer, a planner? What unites these individuals? What connects them? It's a fundamental desire to enhance the human condition, a profession which since 1926 has been symbolized by the Betty Lamp, derived from its German words, bet or besser, meaning to make better. For me to tell my story, I must honor the rich history of family consumer sciences, beginning with its roots. Imagine a life, we're talking about 150 years ago, a time in history marked by events such as the Civil War, the invention of the telephone, or family and education being defined by gender roles. A time when a pioneer in education changed our world as we know it today. Ellen Swallow Richards was the first woman ever accepted to a scientific school, MIT. Because of her, her work, and her legacy, each of us in this room has been impacted. Because of her, we have sanitation engineering. Because of her, we have public health standards. Because of her, we have school lunch programs. In large part a result of Ellen's humble upbringing, one of her primary missions in her scientific mind was to bring science to domestic principles. She wanted to use science to allow women to have time for other pursuits rather than cooking and cleaning, while still maintaining the health of their family. She did this in her home, as pictured here, by opening her home as a laboratory, where she invited women in to learn about science and how they could better manage their homes. Later, her work became so powerful and so in demand, she began organizing conferences. Conferences held in Lake Placid, New York, to bring, again, science to women. From here, the Home Economics Association was born in 1908, and Ellen was its first president. So let's fast forward. 50 years later, to a woman who graduated from the University of Wyoming with a, with a Bachelor of Science in Home Economics, a woman who embodied Ellen's teachings as she applied scientific management to her home. She masterfully raised seven children on a single salary, while still somehow finding time to be a volunteer, a 4-H leader, a botanist. She used, this, used phrases in her home, such as, use discretion, <laughs> all the time. Or she would say, it's not in the budget. And mind you, that budget was managed down to the penny. You knew the price of a single white sock. Or, if it's not done right, it's just not worth doing. She created a family legacy. And these phrases later became ingrained into my own upbringing. Because Ruth mapped me as my grandma, and her daughter, Margie, is my mom. So this is where my story begins. A story where foundational principles of family and consumer sciences were a part of my upbringing before I even knew what it was. I was learning activities of daily living and involvement in things like 4-H. Everything I believed, everything I valued, and what I wanted for my career was found in both the future and the history and the teachings of family and consumer sciences. My home away from home became Harry Call. <laughs> still is. <laughs> a building that was built in 1925 for $140,000 following a design by Fred F. Wilson with the goal of providing a place for women to gather. Women's courses, women's laboratories, and activities for social living. <laughs> well, today's labs, today's courses, and the composition of students looks very, very different. The building still represents the core history of our profession as symbolized as well with our department's motto or theme, enriching human well-being throughout health and human development. 
So philosophically, family consumer sciences today does look different. We're no longer a technical science, rather, we're more of a critical, critical, and practical science. It's a science that's focused on connecting. It's connecting life and careers. It's connecting relationships. It's connecting families. It's fostering well-being. It is the science and the art of living and working. As a practical and critical science, FCS is concerned about empowering students to solve their perennial problems and the emerging problems within our society. We're still focused on providing foundational life skills, but now we're also couched within career and technical education, formerly known as vocational education. Our courses are designed around pathways, pathways that foster student interests, help them think about careers and future opportunities, pathways that leverage local economic workforce demands for talent, to explore careers for our students and help them envision what's your future, what's your next step. Courses that offer through a sequence work-based learning experiences so our students are not only learning, but they're doing as a part of their curriculum and a part of their training. There are three primary pathways that guide FCS education today. The first is visual arts and design. Here, students are learning about careers in apparel and textile production, interior design, manufacturing, merchandising. It's courses like Joanna Krogstead's at Bozeman High, her interior design course that is actually available for dual credit with Gallatin College. <coughs> Our second pathway, hospitality and food production. Within this pathway, we're cultivating a passion in students to pursue careers that address food security issues and community vitality through building a strong hospitality workforce, a top economic need in Montana. It's culinary arts courses, such as this one in Eureka, Montana, where the students are not only learning how to prepare amazing food, but they're also running a catering business out of their classroom and out of their school. It's courses such as Jamie Deals in Ennis, Montana, with a focus on farm to table, where they're growing, they're preparing, and they're serving nourishing foods in their community. Our education and human services pathway is designed for students to experience a, and cultivate a passion in students to explore careers that address some of Montana's greatest economic needs. It's encouraging students to explore education and become an educator and address our rural teacher shortage. It's encouraging students to explore how can you help others and help your community and those around you, perhaps via being a social worker or a counselor, addressing and being a part of the solution for our mental health concerns throughout Montana. It's helping students learn about early childhood and the multiple roles they can play to help young children and increase quality access to childcare opportunities throughout our state. It's programs like Kim Kanoki's in Forsyth here, where her students are not only learning to design developmentally appropriate lesson plans, but in partnership with their local library, her students are delivering those lesson plans in their community. Or Shea Bursma's class in Townsend, Montana where she has fostered a teaching partnership with her elementary classrooms as well as her local HRDC, and her students are learning about education and delivering lessons and using those skills. They're learning and doing. Family Consumer Sciences throughout Montana is strong. These are just a few of the stories of the amazing work of our, within our communities. It's within over 100 communities throughout Montana, impacting over 12,000 students each year. Yet, our greatest threat to the profession right now is a teacher shortage, and a shortage of family consumer sciences educators. As depicted in the map, every green state reflects a state um, that has a critical teacher shortage of family consumer sciences trained professionals. Data tells us that for every undergraduate student, they have their choice of 10 jobs. It's true in Montana as well. They're heavily sought after, and they can go a lot of different places. But as a department, we want to address this issue. We want to be a part of the solution. So we've started new programs, such as our CTE Consortium, where we're working in partnership with agriculture education and technology education to say, how can we provide innovative ways to offer courses across departments to build a culture of CTE, while simultaneously recruiting students and creating unique opportunities, such as our Teach CTE Day, held in the fall, in partnership with the Office of Public Instruction, to bring students to campus and make campus not seem quite so scary, even. Or, it's bringing back the Montana Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America Conference to our MSU campus. This used to be FHA, for those of you in the room. So, <laughs> Future Homemakers of America Conference. 
Here we are bringing together almost 700 students, volunteers, teachers, chaperones, guest evaluators, to campus for two days, where the students are being recognized for their leadership, being recognized for their service for their community, and they're presenting projects that they have designed and delivered that address a local need in their community. They're learning to be a part of the solution. We also have, through our Human Development and Family Sciences program, have really worked within our graduate program to increase access to our campus and to provide opportunities for those who are seeking an endorsement in teaching family consumer sciences with a content-rich opportunity to do so. And so for teachers throughout Montana who are licensed in another content area, they can work with our graduate program to receive added endorsement in FCS. It's a win-win for a lot of our communities where people might be place-bound to their rural and local community, yet they still want a quality education and that opportunity for more employment. And so um, part of this program is also every summer bringing together both our provisionally licensed educators with our current classroom um, FCS teachers to share best practices, to engage with our faculty, and to quite honestly enhance the resiliency as a teacher by having a sense of community. Within our undergraduate program, work-based learning is a key part of what we do throughout several programs. One of the unique opportunities I have on our team is to also coordinate internship opportunities to provide career support to our students in our human development and family science, early childhood education and child services programs, and community health programs to support 30 to 50 students each semester in exploring what is your passion, what is your next step, what do you want to do with your career? When we're maybe not talking long term, we're maybe just talking tomorrow, but what's next? And for them, it's almost 30 plus agency partners that are benefiting from our students throughout the Gallatin Valley. And last year alone, our students dedicated over 13,000 hours of service in this community through a win-win partnership of having an internship opportunity. And so, as you hear my story, it's one about connection. It's one about connecting the gap between knowing and understanding. It's connecting people is connecting opportunity, is connecting relationships. If my grandmother would be here today, I know what she would say to me. She would say, never be complacent, love your family, give to your community, and most importantly, never stop being curious. Ask, how can I serve? How can I be of help? What can I do to make a difference? She would remind me that family and consumer sciences is the art and the science of building strong families and strong communities, both for our present and our future. And a big part of why we do what we do is for our future. Because when I look in these eyes, I see an engineer, I see a baker, a dreamer, an entrepreneur. And it's for these reasons I keep saying yes to FCS. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Karen Myers. I'm a professor in the Adult and Higher Education program. Finding meaning in the Argyle sweater. Meaning making is fundamental to the lived experience. I teach courses in college teaching, student learning theory, statistics, and qualitative inquiry. And in all of these courses, it's fundamental that students understand the meaning in order to learn. Meaning making process is one in which we explore the cognitive, social, and personal dimensions of our life. We ask questions such as, how do I know? Who am I? How do I relate to others? Here's an example. What does this mean to you? When I ask students this question, some will be literalist and they'll say, oh, it's a candle. I think you're out there, Colin. <laughs> Other students will comment that it symbolizes warmth or aroma. If you're living in California with the intermittent blackouts, you might even think that it's light. My husband has a paradoxical relationship with candles and the way he makes meaning with them. On the one hand, he knows his wife likes candles and that this means a romantic evening of dinner and dancing. 
On the other hand, he loathes cleaning up the wax on the floor the next morning. <laughs> Hi, Scott. <laughs> Meaning making is the process, and it's dependent on who we are, our cultures, our values, and our past experiences. We use those to construct an understanding of our experiences. I grew up in a small town in Ohio. I was the youngest of three older brothers. I lived at a time where it was privileged, in the woods, where my mother would tell me and my brothers to go out and play and don't come home until dinner. <laughs> that was my mom. She managed the home and that's how she managed us. My father was a mechanical engineer and he owned a steel fabricating company. He had a quick wit. He likes to tell the story that when I was two or three, he would tell me that I was his favorite daughter, and I would just look up at him and smile. When I got to be around four, which is Piaget's formal operation of meaning makings, I, I looked up at him and I said, Dad, I'm your only daughter. And he just smiled. My parents had a beautiful marriage. They built our home, and they playfully posed as the American Gothic. <laughs> my mom used to say that her and my father's ability to love and laugh is what got her through having three teenagers in high school at one time. My mom adored my dad's sense of humor. There was no circumstance that, she, that he could not make her laugh. Their humor was an essential part of how they made meaning of their lives. They had a great love, but that's another story. Robert Keegan is the originator of meaning-making theory. And he said that there are no events except for those in which we actively derive meaning from. It's our emotional, cognitive, and social regulation that we use to construct an understanding of these events that make them an experience. In 2010, I was diagnosed with stage three, triple negative breast cancer. This isn't a story about chemo or radiation or the multiple surgeries. Rather, this is a story about how I use my parents' love for humor and Keegan's meaning-making theory to make sense of my experience. During those dark days, Scott and I tried to maintain a sense of normalcy. We'd wake up every morning, have our coffee, we'd read the daily newspaper, and we'd end our morning by turning to the comic section. One of my favorites was the Argyle sweater. One morning, I came across this Argyle sweater. And it said, life's unanswered questions. And I thought to myself, well, I better get started answering these questions while I still have time. I invite you to go on the journey with me to answer life's unanswered questions and to make meaning of your own lives and the relationships you have with others. Frame one. Here we have the grim reaper, the when. How do we know when? Well, this particular frame seemed very poignant at the time. And the short answer to that is we often do not know. Since my diagnosis and subsequent no evidence of disease, I've lost a number, a number of loved ones. I've lost my mom. Woo! <laughs> I lost my father-in-law. And I lost a number of beloved pets. All of those were grieved, but they were expected. I also lost individuals, friends, colleagues, in tragic and unexpected ways. It was those unexpected losses that I found myself wondering, how was it that I survived when my friends all of whom who had children, passed away so suddenly. 
A fundamental quality to meaning making is what we call cognitive reappraisal. This is a strategy of changing the trajectory of an emotional response by reinterpreting the emotional trigger. So, what did I do? I <laughs> reinterpreted the emotional trigger. Clearly, some, losing someone is an emotional loss. And what I found myself doing is not focusing on the loss, but focusing on the gifts that my loved ones gave me. Gifts that I continue to give to the people important and who remain in my life. I strive to live in the here and now, not the when. The second frame, who? We have the stig. Who's the stig behind the mask? Who am I? Fundamental to meaning making is understanding who we are and what we bring to the meaning making process. The process is reciprocal. Who we are is used to make an understanding of our experiences, and in turn, our experiences shape who we are. We all have multiple roles and identities. I'm a wife, a daughter, a sister, a teacher, a colleague, and so much more. Irma Bombeck, the great writer and poet, once was asked, who is your favorite child? And she responded, the one who needs me the most at that time. This same logic can be applied to our identities. In order to make meaning art of our experience, the who becomes the process of understanding which identity is most salient given the circumstances for us to navigate the situation and make sense of it. This next frame's a little funny on the surface. <laughs> It takes five extra seconds, Charlene. Why? We all have our idiosyncrasies that bother us. It may be someone not replacing the roll of toilet paper, leaving cabinet doors open. For me, it's often not using a coaster. <laughs> In meaning-making theory, there are, Keegan says, there are no feelings, no thoughts, no events, except independent of the context in which we make them conscious. Therefore, mindfulness is part of the meaning-making process. Mindfulness is our ability to bring awareness to a situation and make the experience conscious. And here's how it works. Keegan talks about the zone of mediation. The zone of mediation is the space between the event that occurs, such as going to the restroom and not having toilet paper, and the response that you have. And that space is where mindfulness lies. Mindfulness occurs when you consider what your response will be, and knowing that that may, in, may impact the outcome. Therefore, the why only becomes a why if you mindfully choose to raise your level of consciousness about the thoughts and events to make it an experience. Happiness. Five miles. Where? Another agenteal property of meaning making is intentionality. You intentionally consider who you are, how you act, and where you find happiness. For me, the where lies in the social aspect of how I find happiness with my friends and family, and then the personal aspect of how I see myself and what makes me happy. The where becomes the active process of finding happiness in the lived experiences. Therefore, happiness is not an outcome, but becomes a journey. And the where are the experiences that we intentionally choose along that path. Happy, happy anniversary. How? <laughs> Scott and I will be celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary this year. <laughs> 
We are often asked, how are you so happy after being together so long? <laughs> There's a form of qualitative inquiry called phenomenology. And phenomenology... <laughs> Phenomenology aims to understand the lived experiences of individuals. We often refer to the phenomenon as the essence, and the essence is comprised of the what in the hows. For Scott and I, the what of the activities are things we enjoy doing, traveling, skiing, reading, working together. The how is the deep respect and care we have for each other in our relationship. The essence of our togetherness is constructed through these what's and these how's, and they, we derive meaning from them. In closing, I hope you enjoyed the journey through the meaning making of life's unanswered questions and that you will be able to find your own life journey and the process by which you make meaning through your experiences, your relationships, and yourself. Just know that it is a continuous journey. Thank you. My notes, I think. Okay. Um, <laughs> to keep it straightforward. Um, hi, I'm Christine Lutz. I'm an assistant professor of early childhood education and child services. Try to fit that on a business card. Um, I'm truly a teacher educator, and it's my greatest joy at MSU to have found this path and to tell you a little bit about my story and how I got there and here. Um, stay with me for the next 10 minutes. Okay. Um, thank you for this opportunity to share um, a little bit about myself and my work. Um, I think it's worth noting that I received this award in part for some of the work that I'm doing with the Fort Peck Reservation. I'm writing some curriculum for the Head Start uh, across the reservation around the return of the buffalo. And throughout the project, and it's gone on for, for some time, will continue into the future. It's a, it's a truly wonderful collaboration, and it's reminded me of how much I love teaching preschool and how much I love teaching teachers. And I continue to go back to and am drawn to projects where I get to do both. And that's really what my story is about tonight. Um, I was recently invited by a colleague to write about my early years as a preschool teacher and how that's impacted me as a teacher educator. So what you're looking at is a word cloud. My students say I'm obsessed with word clouds, and they would be right. Um, I use them a lot. I'm a visual learner. I like to capture a lot of words and throw them out there. So this is um, part of my early years teaching. You're going to hear a lot of these words as I'm talking tonight. Um, and just to listen. Listen to the things that I've learned and some lessons that perhaps I'll share with you today. My story begins as an undergraduate teacher candidate in Boston. I was an elementary education major. I thought for sure I wanted to be a third grade teacher for most of my life. My mother kindly reminded me that my lack of patience with my younger brother might impede my ability to be a good teacher, um, but that didn't stop me. So off I went. Um, and one of my early field experiences as an undergraduate teacher candidate is really what transformed my love of early childhood, actually. I was placed in a Montessori program, and I hadn't known very much about Montessori at all. When I walked into this school in downtown Boston, this old refurbished brownstone, I was struck by the beauty of the environment, and I knew that the learning environment was going to be really important to my teaching, but there in that space, I truly felt that. Everything was just amazing and beautiful, and I wanted to explore with the children. I was amazed, too, by Montessori's approach to children becoming independent thinkers, um, but also really strong collaborators and negotiators. Peace education is something that's very dear to Montessori and also dear to my own teaching. And so, as I continued in my field experience, um, as I said, profoundly affected by this, carried on with my courses. I graduated, I got my teaching degree, and I looked for jobs. Um, and my very first teaching position was in a preschool. And I hadn't had a lot of time outside of the Montessori experience. Um, I moved past third grade. I thought maybe I'm not as patient to be with third graders. I don't know. Um, and so preschool was it. And for me, um, 
I truly realized that working with three, four, and five-year-olds was where it's at. Um, I was with three, four, and five-year-olds today. Um, Susie's out there somewhere. It's so hard to see everyone. Um, I get to do both now. I get to work with threes, fours, and fives, and I get to work with college students, and it all started back in Boston as an undergraduate teacher candidate. So in those early years, um, I kept thinking about Montessori, and I kept thinking about how was I going to get back to that place where I was first so inspired. And after teaching preschool in and around Boston for a few years, I was drawn back to the same Montessori program where I had been as a teacher candidate. And I took a position, and on my very first day, I met Joe and Susan. I could tell immediately as I waited at the door, as Joe and Susan were coming up the stairs, that it was going to be Susan that was going to have the hardest time saying goodbye to Joe that morning. And I was all prepared and ready to crouch down and say hi to Joe and welcome him into the classroom and off we would go for our day and Susan would just go off onto her day. Well, guess what? That's not how it happened at all. I said hi to Joe. He hid behind his mother and he didn't want to come into the classroom. I looked up at Susan and now she was crying and crying and crying and I thought, okay, teacher education, I've got to really step up and think about what it is I can do to help ease us all into the day. And so I realized I needed to create a similar plan for both of them. And so what I did was I stepped back and I listened and I learned. I learned a lot about Susan and her story. I learned that Joe was her miracle baby. She didn't think that she was ever going to have a family and it took her a long time before Joe arrived. His first four years were spent exploring the city with his mother, and today was the first day she was leaving him with somebody else. What an amazing responsibility I had, and that impact, I just need to sit with it, because it so affects me, and thinking about how important that is for a parent. And I think the reason why it affects me so much is that in that moment, in that first early experience teaching, I wasn't a parent then. I had no idea what it would be like as a parent to bring your preschooler to strangers for the first time. When I became a parent and had to do that, when I drove away sobbing, I wish I had remembered this story then and thought, <laughs> it'll all be okay. <laughs> but I tell my students this now, right, and say, like, they will cry, parents will cry. It might not be the children who cry, it'll be the parents who cry. And what do we do with that? And so in getting to know Joe and Susan, I listened and I learned. I listened and learned, as I said, of their story. Joe became more comfortable in the classroom. Susan still struggled. She still struggled when she brought Joe to school. Um, and I realized she needed a plan for the day. I got Joe to be comfortable in the classroom. Um, in the morning, we established a routine. So he would come into school, say good morning, and I would say, what's the plan for today? And he would tell me where he wanted to go and where he wanted to start his day. And then I would turn to Susan and say, what's your plan for today? It was just as important that she had a sense of where she was going so that she knew what Joe was up to as well. It was an important part of the day. It was an important part of the routine. We did the same thing every day for the whole year. When I think about that story and the impact it's had on me as a teacher educator, I think about the ways that I help my students prepare for their day and their time that they spend with me. And so my routine that I create is at the start of every lecture or every experience, we'll talk about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. What's the plan? What is it that we're doing today together and why is that meaningful and important? I set aside some doing days um, in my curriculum course where we explore different materials and we write lessons for children that my students will implement in their field placements and I remind them that those early field experiences are incredibly, incredibly impactful and I share with them my early field experiences. I encourage my students to listen and to learn. They listen and learn with and from one another. They review each other's work. They pay attention to how those lessons are being carried out in their spaces and classrooms. They listen to the teachers, and they especially listen to the children. I tell them about Joe and Susan, and I also tell them about Aaron. And this is the part I will read. I remember three-year-old Aaron vividly. His hair was spiked, his grin mischievous, and he bounced rather than walked from one place to the next. The Montessori environment might be a challenge for him, I thought. When calm and order were expected, Aaron caused a commotion. Other teachers I worked with found it difficult to connect with Aaron because he wouldn't sit long enough for a lesson and he always wanted to talk about things other than the work in front of him. However, Aaron's expressive vocabulary was quite impressive and I often found myself enthusiastically chatting with him at the end of each day as we waited patiently for his mother, who worked a significant distance away from the school and she was often caught in traffic and running late. She always arrived looking a bit disheveled. 
and she hardly took a moment to talk about Aaron's day because she was always in a rush, which reminded me of the way that Aaron flitted about the classroom and the school. Some would argue that Aaron's fit with Montessori was not a good one, but in fact, Montessori truly believed in the power of movement and the connection that movement has with learning and cognition. And so while I enthusiastically engaged Aaron in his want and desire to move, I tried to help others understand that this was his gift, this was his voice, this was his joy that he was bringing to us. And then I listened, and I learned from Aaron's previous teachers. He and his mother had to rush home every day so, he could get, so she could get to her second job. She would do anything to afford the tuition at the school, even if it meant spending less time with her son. As a result, Aaron spent nearly all his time away from school with adults, including grandparents, aunts, uncles, and neighbors, to accommodate, to accommodate his mother's busy schedule. Knowing this, I was committed even more to spending as much time with Aaron as I could to help him develop relationships with other children who he was missing in his life outside of school. I wanted him to become a confident learner and a leader, and I wanted him to feel that like he belonged at school. Preschool became a predictable part of Aaron's unpredictable life, and I intended to maintain that consistency and constancy in his life. And because of his hectic schedule, that resulted from the many demands and directions his mother was pulled into, Aaron often arrived at school overtired and emotionally fragile. His need for action, coupled with his need for rest, resulted in intense behavioral breakdowns and an inability to regulate his emotions. On many occasions, I could hear Aaron's cries from the third floor of the school, and I would navigate my way toward him to offer some reassurance. We had a strong bond that was built on the attention I was able to provide him and the deep connection that we had made through my efforts to listen and respond with care. One particular event stands out above the rest. Aaron was gasping for breath as his sobs took hold of him. His eyes told me that he was scared. I sat next to him and I asked that he look at my eyes. And I said, Aaron, take a breath with me, slow and steady. I took a deep breath in, and I slowly blew the air out from my lips, modeling how to breathe with intention, all keeping my eyes locked to his. It took several requests, all delivered in the same calm tone, but Aaron finally began to calm his breathing. I put his hand on his rapidly beating chest and said, feel this, your heart is beating so fast. And we sat in that space and in that moment. And I told him again, take a breath with me, slow and steady. The consistency of my words and the quiet tone of voice I chose to use became the routine I used with Aaron throughout the year. And nearly every day, we took a deep breath together, slow and steady. I don't remember what had upset Aaron so much that day, but I do remember the impact that moment had on me. Aaron's motor was always running, and so his heartbeat reflected his energy but his state of despair had put him into overdrive. Helping Aaron calm down by focusing on his breathing was something he learned to do independently, and I caught him several times after that incident out on the playground with his hand on his chest, trying to calm himself and doing some deep breaths. He was becoming self-aware. It's my own self-awareness that has helped me find success as a teacher educator, but also as a parent and finding that balance and thinking about the things that truly bring us joy and what makes us tick, what send us into overdrive and what helps us to develop a plan and know where we're headed, all of these are really critical to our success as human beings. The listening and the learning that I've done so many times continues to move me forward and to pass along the joy of early childhood education to my students. When my teacher candidates are feeling overwhelmed, I encourage them to take a breath. I listen and I learn about their hopes, their fears, their goals, and their challenges. And I often ask them, what's your plan for today? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jane Downey, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Education here at MSU. And I am, I am just so excited to be here with you tonight. I want to share with you some points of light, some inspiration, some hope from rural education. 
that comes from around the globe. In my role at MSU, I have the honor of serving as the director for the Center for Research on Rural Education. And I get to work with some amazing uh, group of faculty and doctoral students. Some of them are up there. <laughs> um, it is such a joy to work on behalf of the state of Montana, our, our rural communities, schools, and our kids to find ways to serve and to help them do what, what they do best. This work is really important to me because I'm a rural kid. This is where I grew up. This is my home. Um, my family still farms here. Um, and some people have said to me in the past, they've looked at that and they said, oh, that's quite lovely. Looks like it's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> but I will tell you tonight, and some of you have heard me say this before, that is the middle of somewhere. <laughs> it's somewhere very important to me. And that context helps to make sense of who I am and, and what I do and why I do what I do. This question of rural comes up a lot. and We've already actually um, heard it a little bit um, tonight. What is rural? It's so many things to, to different people in different places um, here in the U.S., but also across the world. In a lot of places, rural is basically considered low population density. When we, we think of that here in Montana, well, in some of our counties, we have fewer than five people per square mile. Now, remember, we, we um, cattle outnumber people three to one in, in, in our state. Um, so that, that is a factor that work fits here in, in Montana. And rural is also defined globally and, and here as distance from an urban center. And so in both of those definitions, it's low density and distance from, from urban. It starts, starts to sound like there's a bit of a, maybe a negative um, message around some of those things. Well, when I've looked through the literature, there's a fascinating number of ways that people talk about this idea of rural as a, as a, as a distance, but also as a kind of a viewpoint or a perspective. It's a, some, for, for, for some people, it's a demographic. For some people, it's a place. Others describe it as an absence of urban. Um, and others think about it as a culture or a population or sometimes even a research agenda. If we look to the, the news, if we look to reports uh, from around the world, what is happening in these places that we call rural? Well, one is that we've seen a declining um, population in rural places across the, across the world over time. <coughs> and in what are, what's referred to as non-metropolitan um, places, so i.e. rural here in the, in the U.S., poverty levels are much higher in a lot of rural places. When we think about the opioid crisis that we have, death by opioid is occurring much more in rural contexts and rural places than it is in, in urban. And Montana has the un, very unfortunate um, distinction of ha having the highest suicide rate in the country right now. In this context, is that all there is? In this dark time, is that all that is occurring in these rural places? Well, I'm so glad you asked me that because the answer is no. no. Entrepreneurship, did you know this per, per 1,000 residents? Check this out. Where are the red bars? That's rural. Rural entrepreneurship far outweighs 
Metro Entrepreneurship. This is a, a, a map that was created um, by the Regional Center for R uh, Rural Development. They measured social capital. And if you re remember the map that had all the empty spaces, the, the, which were called rural, those are the counties that have the highest level of social capital, as defined by relationships, someone that you can call when you have a need. Academically, look at where our rural kids are coming in, right below the national average and well ahead of town and city kids in eighth grade math. Eighth grade reading, identical. So, there is some good news in these places. I want to give you a few examples because as we come to what you've already heard tonight, this issue of teacher recruitment and retention for rural places, I want to share with you that it is a persistent global challenge. It's not something that's just happening here in Montana. It's not just something that we're struggling with in the country. It is a global challenge for these reasons. It is so complex and multifaceted. When we think of preparing and, um, and hiring and keeping teachers in rural contexts for all of these different kinds of, of um, variations that occur in rural places. What about Montana? Well, a couple of years ago, Renee Rasmussen said to me, Jane, our situation has gone from terrible to crisis in four years. If you know Renee, you know she said that with some emphasis. <laughs> she meant it. Now, when rural people face a crisis, what do we do? What, how do we respond? Well, <laughs> we could stand around and we could assess, have a conversation about how we got into this mess. We could wring our hands and say, oh dear, this, this is not good. Or we could get to work. This was not a good day in my family's uh, farm and life. <laughs> and my father said, I told you not to go. <laughs> and my brother said, well, I thought I could make it. <laughs> and that was kind of the end of the fussing, and then they got to work on the fixing. And so tonight I wanted to share with you that approach. We'll be done with the fussing, and we'll get to the fixing. Wendell Berry, who's a, a poet that I have um, really enjoyed over the years, he said, it is not from ourselves that we learn to be better than we are. And so I would like you to come on a trip with me. Just briefly, I'd like to share with you a couple of points of light from a few places. Let's start in South Africa. In South Africa, there are areas of the country where, in particular areas, more than half the kids in the area um, are rural and attend rural schools. Their rural schools, a lot of them have, do not have running water and do not have electricity. And it is in that context that teacher educators, people like myself, have said, what can we do to make a difference? These people started the Rural Teacher Education Project. And they created some innovative ways that have really been informative for me in the work that I'm, I'm doing and what we're doing here together because they decided that what they needed to start with was to take students as a group. That sending people out by themselves to rural places in isolation was only compounding isolation and that one big change that they could do was to take students as a group with a mentor and experience that um, opportunity to live amongst the community, but to do it together. As we look to the light that's coming from South Africa, we can learn a lot about what we can do here to address our <coughs> rural teacher 
shortage and improve recruitment and improve retention. There's more light. Let's go up to Scotland. And the, the, the program in Scotland is called Knowing Our Place. The, the light that is shining there is coming from colleagues, um, Morag Redford and, and her colleagues, who are doing this amazing work. And they take their students in groups to very small um, rural places with very limited resources. And the piece that they have added is the importance of dialogue between mentor and pre-service teacher. They structure their, their dialogue together to really help n new teachers see themselves in a new way, see themselves professionally and personally as living a life in that rural space and really starting to change how the, the, the young people are see themselves and their profession. It's in these kinds of schools where they're spending time together to have those conversations. One, one more example from Australia. Our colleagues there have been working on this problem of rural teacher preparation for a long time. Um, when they talk about remote, they really mean remote long, long distances. And one of, the, one of the things that they've discovered that has been really powerful is the importance of, of orientation. Orientation for pre-service teachers it, through conversation before they go to, to visit a rural place. But then, this has been, it's been the secret sauce. They've identified a community guide who, who walks them through town who shows them the community and acts as an interpreter for what they're seeing and helps them to see through the eyes of a community member in ways that they would never have been able to see all by themselves. And it's that model of, of formal and informal support that has been really making a, a significant difference in, in their work there. They call it communities of practice. And they involve the teachers, the university, and the community members. Here's the kind of schools. This school was established in 1875. Looks pretty good for being quite old. But this is the, these are their schools, and they are in very remote locations. And they've brought some really forward some really good information for us that sh they've shared with us that we can learn from. And so, is there light here in Montana? I'm happy to say yes, <laughs> there is. And I'm excited to share with you the, the work that we're doing with partnerships with our rural schools based on what we are able to learn from our colleagues around the world. And so, when we think about preparing teachers for rural contexts, we know it's critical that they are prepared to be effective in the classroom. They know their stuff, and they know how to teach, and to communicate, and to, and to work with children. And as you heard earlier tonight, to meet the needs of all learners. We know that's important. They also know how to, need to know about how to be a professional in a school context, and to really build those professional relationships. But we also are, have learned from our colleagues around the world that understanding their connection to community is critical to being effective and to ha having a long and successful pro profession as a, as a teacher. And so we've spent time engaging our students in rural classrooms, giving them opportunities to really work and get to know rural schools in person, out there in Broadus, Montana, in Cutbank, in Shelby, in Sydney, making sure that they have those boots on the ground experiences in schools, but also really coming to understand and value the community that surrounds and supports that school. We're finding that this piece is making a tremendous difference for our students when they talk to us about how much they have valued having someone like Denise Ternay 
serve as their guide and their interpreter and explaining to them what they're seeing and what they're experiencing. And so when we think about these difficult times, there is a lot of challenge that we face in our, in our rural places, in our rural communities. But there is also a growing network of light, of innovation, of hope, of people working and, to, and doing their best to make a difference. There are points of light everywhere. And I'm excited to know, too, that there are points of light right here. Every one of us has light that we can bring, that we can bring to these challenges, that we can bring to these difficult situations. And we've got a, a group that has come together around the, from around the world in, in order to continue to elevate this, to lift this idea of, of helping each other figure out and solve these problems together. So tonight, here in Montana, let's work together and bring our light to keep moving this forward. Thank you. Well, thank you for staying. Um, <laughs> my name is Mitch Fodderloss, and as you can see, I work with really great people. It's a pleasure to work with such intelligent, mindful individuals that spoke tonight and, and, my, and the other throughout the department and in our college. I consider myself lucky. Um, we're going to get weird for a minute. <laughs> in 2005, Stephanie Meyer published her book, Twilight. The book documents a story of a teenage girl who's quite unremarkable, and her name is Bella. And it documents her life as she moved to Forks, Washington to live with her father. While in Washington, she became acquainted with a male classmate named Edward. Turns out, Edward's a vampire. <laughs> because Edward's a vampire, he has a physically cold body, because he's dead. Oh, well, undead. He also has a quick temper, he also has the supernatural ability to hear everyone's thoughts except Bella's. To protect Bella, Edward keeps his romantic feelings to himself because a human shouldn't fall in love with a vampire. So he tries to stay away, but eventually they have romantic adventures. He protects her from many dangerous situations, and spoiler alert, they fall hopelessly in love. <laughs> this became a major motion picture and at the time it came out, I didn't know much about this, this movie or book, apart from some of my friends telling me they like this human vampire romance. <laughs> Upon completing my master's degree in marriage and family therapy, I decided I wanted to be a, a, a therapist, but I also went on and did my PhD. So while I was doing my PhD, I continued to meet with clients. One day I had a client come in, and she was, wanted to talk about some marital issues she was experiencing in her marriage. And usually it's best practice to work with a, people, with a couple when they're experiencing marital issues, but she wanted to meet alone. She expressed some of the challenges she was having with her husband in terms of communication and also some of the hurt she was feeling. And at the end of the, toward the end of the session, she expressed to me, I wish my husband could be more like Edward from Twilight. <laughs> and me being a new and experiential therapist jumped on this and said, before our next session, I would like you to go home and I'd like you to think about three ways your husband is already like Edward from Twilight. So I felt good about it, she felt good about it, and we went on our way. A week later, she came back to meet with me to express, to, she did her homework and she told me the three ways that he was like Edward. She said he was cold, he can't read my thoughts, and he's quick-tempered. <laughs> Hashtag therapist fail. So, not really, and more on this later. But this was an experience that really guided and solidified my research interest in how technology and media influence humans and their relationships. So the Twilight example provides evidence or example of print media and entertainment media. But in the last three decades, we've seen extreme innovations in technology. 
we now have what we refer to as technological convergence, which means that multiple media and technologies now have converged to one device. So most of us have them in our pockets or purses or wherever. So throughout my, my career so far, I've been researching a variety of different technologies from Pokemon Go to just got data on TikTok and <laughs> lots of other areas. But um, I, I want to focus my, research, or my talk tonight just on my research on relationships and technology, and particularly marital relationships and parent-adolescent relationships. I'm appreciative to my research colleagues and the thousands of participants who have allowed me to study this with, um, with lots of data, so it's been exciting. Um, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to leave you with a challenge. So I'm going to share some specific examples from some of the interviews and other ways that I've collected data from these clients, or from these participants. So we know that merit, that technology can provide connection in marital relationships. We know that it allows couples to stay connected when they have busy schedules or when they're apart. But it also can build intimacy in their relationships. One wife stated, technology helps our relationship because my husband is a school teacher and, and a coach, and I'm a mental health worker. So we work all the time, and if it was not for a cell phone and texting, we would have a hard time communicating. Another wife explained, I love my cell phone. Sometimes just texting my spouse, I love you, or receiving the same message makes my day, smiley face emoticon. And her husband shared, technology can affect in a positive way. One can use it to send kind messages to the other person. Participants in, the studies, in my studies have also indicated that they can use technology to build their relationship by spending time together. So they use social media together, they stream shows together, they play video games together, and so on. They also use technology to find activities in their communities in which they can engage together. Despite the positive connections of technology, there are also things that can hurt our relationship related to, te to technology. A wife explained, my husband was always on the computer playing video games, and I was always on the tablet hanging out on Facebook, and we realized that he was only on the computer because he thought I was busy, and I was only on the tablet because I thought he was busy. So we ended up not spending any time together, and then we had to talk to each other, and we were like, wait a second, you weren't busy this whole time? <laughs> a husband communicated, once you start getting distracted by technology, it consumes you, Time flies by. In many cases, this technology becomes more desirable than your mate. And his wife um, similarly stated, technology could distract from the relationship if the person cared more about the technology than the person sitting right next to them. And not, not very few participants, but some indicated that their romantic partners had found all new romantic relationships through technology and it ultimately ended in infidelity. So, we do know that parents and adolescents both use technology, and we do know that they use it to connect with each other in their relationships. An adolescent explained, I think it's kind of good that my parents have Snapchat, because then my mom will send me like these goofy ones sometimes. It kind of makes you laugh a little bit, and it's good to, to, that you can still see your parents when they're away. Adolescents and parents also talk about the benefit of technology in terms of creating autonomy or independence in the relationship for the adolescent. So they can spend time away from their parent, but they can still coordinate rides, and they can connect to each other in case of emergency. We know, too, that technology can distract in parent-adolescent relationships. Parents and adolescents use technology differently, and they use different technologies, and they have different perceptions of technology. Um, an adolescent highlighted, I believe it's because their generation, meaning parents, did not grow up with the, the technology of our day. So they don't understand our fascination with things that help us communicate more easily and efficiently than a phone call or an email. They believe talking in person or calling is easier and a better way of communicating to others. But nowadays, that's considered old school. <laughs> so parents also disclose that they don't know how to use all the technology that their children use. A parent emphasized, I want to know more about how to know how to use all the technology the teenagers know how to use. If we are just as effective as our teenagers, we might be able to understand how best to relate to them and then teach them to monitor themselves. 
Um, finally, uh, parents and adolescents see technology promoting closeness differently in their relationships. One study my colleagues and I conducted um, looked at a variety of different communication technologies in the parent-adolescent relationship. Um, we were specifically looking at quality time, which was defined as feeling close, connected, and together. Um, as you can see, the adolescents in their reports found that texting predicted quality time with their, with their mother um, and texting promoted quality time with their father. But when you look at parents' reports, texting doesn't appear. So texting didn't lead to feeling more quality in the relationship. So it's important to understand that even within the same families in the same relationships using the same technology, people have different experiences. So technology is not going anywhere. We know it's here to stay. We know that it can enhance our lives, and we know that it can hurt our lives. My argument as a family therapist and a family scholar is that if we want to harness the positive aspects of technology, we need to do it within the context of our relationships. So some of my research has highlighted that couples in satisfying relationships have established expectations and routines around technology. My research on adolescents and parents has shown that adolescents want their parents to be involved in their technology use, but they want to have a voice and have conversation about setting rules related to their technology. Um, so, one of my other things that I think about in terms of therapy is sometimes I have parents drop off their teenager and say, help my teen use their technology better. But as I observe the parents' interactions with technology, they are not modeling the behaviors they expect in their children. Hence, I believe that if we really want to make changes, we have to do it at the family level and relational level. So, here's a challenge for you. The challenge is, I want you all to commit to one week of technology observation. And I, would, I hope that what you would do is have it guided by these two questions. What does technology add to my relationships? And what does technology, how does technology distract from my relationships? I would encourage you to do this in your families. That could be your, your couple relationship, that could be your, with children, that could be your roommates, like whoever you consider your family. But do this and then commit a week later to having a sit-down conversation together to discuss what you find. When you do have your sit-down conversation, agree not to be accusatory, but focus on your own experience. And this process can be a very helpful way to begin st to establish a family-level media plan. So HealthyChildren.org is an organization that has a, a specific guide on how to set up a healthy family media plan. And a lot of it's targeted to children, but many of the, the expectations or examples can be adapted to any type of relationship. For example, you can have a media-free location in your home, like the dinner table, or you can have a family phone charging station where everyone plugs in their phones at the same time every night. So you can be creative yourself. You don't have to use all of those. But the, the next thing I'd like you to do after you create the plan is to establish a time period to check back in with each other. And maybe that's two weeks. And then check in and see how it's working. Is it, is it helping our family? Or do we need to make some changes and course correct? Evaluation's key. So back to my therapy experience. My client and I, who talked about her husband wanting to be like Edward, spent some time talking about the show and she educated me a little bit and what it was about. And we both decided that there was some unrealistic and unattainable relationship expectations <laughs> in that show. <laughs> However, what she realized was that the the, the Twilight theme resonated with her because she had a need to feel prioritized by her husband. So we should make our family members feel and our close friends like Edward made Bella feel when he said, you are my life now. I, think, I believe that most of us or want our, like our relationships, so we should prioritize them. So in closing, if you don't remember anything that I said in this presentation, I hope you'll maybe just consider this one summary statement. We must prioritize our relationships and then work within our relationships to determine the appropriate role of technology. Thank you.
<laughs> After the first couple of speakers, I told Mitch she might as well just go home. <laughs> I was just kidding. I have a question for the audience. Do we have amazing faculty in the college? <laughs> I will be rewarding them with an all-expense-paid lunch at Rendezvous Dining Hall. <laughs> or Miller, if you like to walk in circles and get dizzy. I prefer Rendezvous. Um, we also have amazing staff, so I want to thank three people. Where's Karen Funk? Wave your hands up there. Planner, organizer, communicator, um, where's Becky Stanton? Woo! Filler of any gap created by a problem. That's Becky's job. And our artistic director. And then Kate Kaminsky also is not here, but she's my assistant dean, and she um, helps speakers as needed. So, thank you for that. So I've had so much fun. I, I think we should do it again next year. Um, Clap if you think we should do it again next year. We will then. <laughs> Feel free to hang around and socialize with our speakers. I know they'd love to talk to you if you have some, some questions. Um, but thank you so much for spending your evening with us. Um, it's been a lot of fun, and it's great to see you all. Um, we'll see you again next time. <laughs>